Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Initiate Intel update. In September? What happened in March? Better radio Batman. Hello team, and welcome back to Intel update number 23. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host Rich and producer Neil. Hey, everyone. In this Intel update, we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been, what's coming up, uh, what's happening right now, and uh, when you can expect to hear us back for season four. So update you all on the th- where we've been, what's been happening, and where we're at currently. And to do that, first off, Rich, what are your answers to those very vague questions? Where I've been. So uh, most people know that I had a big lifestyle change a couple of years ago. So I have now been in our new house to almost exactly a year. Right now, we, yep, we were looking for the house this time last year, but we we bought it not not long after that. So life this last year has been phenomenal. I feel so much better. Community is fantastic here. Um, we've met some incredible people. I'm feeling great. And then on top of that, I've had the bandwidth, the time, the energy, and all the things for us to start recording again. So we actually have many episodes in the can uh, and getting prepped for getting us back on the air again. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later, right, Neil? We are. I was also looking at the last time that we've updated people. So yes, this is all very relevant. Because I was like, wait a second. What if that timeline is not what I thought it was? Oh, it's what I thought it was. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so things here have been phenomenal. So I am, uh, I'm excited to be back on the air. One of the things that we've been holding for a while is a catacon. So last year's a catacon, Neil and I were there with the Caleb G. And the Caleb G and I met for the first time in person ever. Which is at, at, truly surprising as someone who was there to visually wild. watch that happen while being confused the other the entire time. That doesn't it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me then. It, it does, doesn't make sense. I, I get to me it. Now. I get it. We'd known each other for years online, and then he's the one that convinced me to do the podcast to start with and told me he would do all the work and he did all the hard work. But we had never met in person until uh almost a year ago now. And so while we were at a catacon, Neil got a in-person interview with the two of us talking about the thing that Caleb's wanting to come back on to talk about, which was the use of magic in DC and in Young Justice, because we got some really, really good stuff covering a lot of different magical types on this season. So it worked out really, really well. So that's been in the can waiting as a uh, waiting uh, to be aired. And we will talk about when that airs and when we're going to get ourselves back online um, a little bit later in the show. So, Emily, what have you been up to and what are you doing? Well, I've been up to a lot. Uh, This past year, while for Rich was phenomenal, there were some struggles uh, in my life that a lot of that's personal stuff and things. But we ran into some stuff this year where every time we were kind of like, oh, maybe we can start recording this month, something would happen uh, for a while this past year, uh, which was a thing of part of why we have been so delayed. I had some health issues. I've had some family stuff going on uh, for a while there that kept being like, so we can't record because I have other things going on. Yeah. But uh, in in happier news and exciting news, I have uh, a new job that I love. That's my non-creative outlet job that I occasionally post book recommendations (laughs) from uh, (laughs) on on Instagram. If you follow me over there, you have seen those. I could have staff picks there. And so that's great. I love that. I've 
done. I know all of us have had a couple of different like creative projects that we've released in the past year of little things we have done in between trying to get whelmed back on track. It's on team up moves and a couple other things like that. And now we are back here doing whelmed after I have I have read the classic literature. I have prepped to talk about <laughs> all of that. We are we are ready to go. We are underway. As uh, Rich said, we have several episodes already in the can that are ready to be released, and we'll reveal when those are going to be released uh, near the end of this. Stick around. So Emily, like we both been kind of getting back into and doing some recording on some other shows as well. Um, we were actually both guests on. Kill Every Monster uh, over with a Ramen Dylan. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, Kill Every Monster is a very cool, interesting uh, D&D podcast that is part actual play and part storytelling discussion where they bring on guests to discuss a particular monster from the Monster Manual and talk about what makes them interesting, how to put them in a game, whether or not they're really a monster, and then we play a little game. And Rich was on for uh, the Aboleth. Mm -hmm. Yep, it was the Aboleth, yeah, which is like a Cthulhu-like uh, underwater horror. And it was it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I loved it. And you were on for the Lady in the Tree. Dryad episode, yes. Because uh, dryads are just uh, magic ladies living in trees. <laughs> and <laughs> that was my whole bit. <laughs> It was an excellent bit. It was so excellent that uh, you got an Audioverse uh, nomination. I did, and you got an Audioverse win. I, I did. I did actually. Yes, I actually did. I kind of forgot about that. Yes, I did. I got a nomination <laughs> I'm as like, well. You're hyping I, up my nomination. I, I'm like, you won. <laughs> I forgot about that. For uh, best uh, best guest in... Uh, in a, was it just actual play I, or was it d, &D think, specific? No, it wasn't d, &D. It was like best guest. It was a very long title. They were both like, like they were yeah. both like best guests in an established series or something like that, an established podcast, something like something that. Like that. Uh, the other the other winner was the mimic episode. I'm so sorry, I don't remember who the guest was. But that mimic episode was was fantastic. Actually, all the episodes I've listened to have been pretty mind blowing. So you should go check. It's a very it's a very good. It's podcast. very good. You should check um, it out. Dylan and Aram are great. And not to leave Neil out, Neil also has a kill every monster coming up. It's not out yet. Uh, at the time nope. of us recording this, but nope. it will be well, out. It's after. been announced. Oh, it has. Uh, and it's, oh, it's going to be. I'm I didn't even sure. notice that. I mean, I've said it before, but I don't. I don't know. I don't pay attention to a lot of things. What uh, and and what critter? What critter are you talking about? Uh, the Displacer Beast. I actually went back and read the original sci-fi novel that it was based off of. Which, if it, if D and D did anything that that sci-fi novel did, it would be the most terrifying creature that has ever existed. Bar none. I mean, Displacer Beasts are not are not cuddly. You want them to be cuddly, but they're definitely not. So, yeah. So look forward to that. It should come up this season, right? This season of Kill Every Monster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think they announced their lineup for this season, and that's should be soon. Sometime. I can't wait. <laughs> Sometime soon-ish. I can't wait to hear it either. But, yeah, I did. We both did that. I was on... Yeah, I was very recently on um, Team Up Moves, which is a very cool actual play podcast hosted by uh, Fiona and Stephanie. And it is a show uh, of the two of them playing through with guests every superhero RPG they can find, basically, to create a superhero universe, a city and the comic book universe that it exists in and i uh was on for an episode playing marvelous that is a very heavily masks inspired game about playing teenage superheroes but whereas ma whereas in masks you are intentionally playing a team in marvelous you can be far more uh separate and chaotic <laughs> in how you all know each other um and our group had had a non-powered kind of guy in the chair Lois Lane kind of character who was just the human running around with all of us it had a super villain as one of our our four characters and I played a uh, little teenage witch who can talk to ghosts um, very little bit Zatanna a little bit uh, everything else and she was a very fun character to play so yeah that's a very fun show check it out 
Uh, they do a lot of really cool stuff over there. Oh, in the world of uh, voice acting, I'm also now a reoccurring supporting character on a show called Electromancy that is about kids going to a magic school and learning secrets and uh, possibly dealing with corrupt government secrets in their fictional world. <laughs> and I can't say much about that because I've only been in uh, one episode of that so far and I can't say much about my character without giving spoilers but uh, it's a cool interesting little show uh, and if you hear me in one episode and are like well that was cool I will be in others I just can't tell you how many or what I'll be doing in them <laughs> nice I think I've been in a couple things too while you were talking I was like wait I've done more than kill every monster I think I was I guess that I think on two episodes now of farm to fable which Neil has talked about in the past. It's the Smallville rewatch series done by our friend Michael from the RPG Academy Network. And uh, I was also on an episode. <laughs> it's a, this is a bit of a stretch, but I, I am a, a, a big Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams fan. And so our friend Aaron has a podcast called The Complete Dis Discography, and it is a read through and uh, uh, kind of an analysis podcast on all of the 40 plus novels in the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett. Um, so I was a guest on the episode uh, that we were reviewing a, a book called Making Money, which is fantastic, but I absolutely recommend so much Terry Pratchett. Um, uh, Small Gods, phenomenal. Night Watch is one of my favorites. There's a re It's really, really good, good stuff. If you, if you like a, a good, well-written, intellectual, witty, comedy fantasy stuff and the podcast is fantastic so if you like terry pratchett go up it's the it's the english spelling of complete so it's like the c-o-m-p-l-e-a-t discography obviously from the Discworld series so i've been on the, that too so you can go and check those things out what about you neil have you been guessing on anything uh no you got, you got any other podcasts or I, anything I mean i have a lot of i mean i have a lot of free time <laughs> i uh <laughs> <laughs> I stopped going to the place that was employing me. And, you know, often people ask, like, what's that like? And I said, it could be better and it could be worse. I could keep going there. Did I make a lot of money there? Yeah. I did. Uh, do I get to spend a lot of time with my kids and invest into them and my mom and everyone else? I do. Um, and I am a generally happier person. So with that, yeah, the Dungeon Master's Block is still going strong. Diamnastics, I folded back in uh, because I kind of run that show. And for my own personal and production sanity, I kind of put everything back <laughs> into one spot because it's all back together. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just very <laughs> difficult to have multiple things going out multiple places, especially when they're uh, super similar. Uh, but with some of that, that also afforded me the time to be a professional dungeon master on a cruise. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, D20 cruise. Yeah, so yes. D20 Cruise is um, event.cruises. Go check it out. They have several other cruises. Um, so this was like their seventh event they had put on. And it was very, very well run for the fact that we had basically over 200 people for their first time out doing a D&D cruise. Didn't you say they had to expand it out because they like a couple sold time. out completely and they a couple, a couple times, times over. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Sold out, added more, sold out, added more, sold out. And basically at that point, they were at capacity of what the surprise we were put in the basement. That's where the convention center is. <laughs> um, there's only one floor beneath and it's where the, the crew is, not people. Um, so, yeah, it had basically completely filled their convention center area. Um, but they're. There, there'll be another one next year, and hopefully I get invited back because I had a spectacular time. I actually, for the first time ever, and certainly the first time doing it with then, obviously these have to go together. The first time doing it with someone else is um, co-DMing front to back, like the whole three days for someone. Um, and it was with the GM, Tim, who is really, really good. And for whatever reason, he and I worked flawlessly together. Um, and you would, those people did not know that it was the first time we have ever gamed together at the same table. Nonetheless, ever co DM. Much less co DM'd a game. Yeah. That's wild. And so, yeah, the people. Um, Neil and I have both uh, applied to come. I, I, he's applying to come back. I applied because why would I not apply to do this thing? I have not heard back yet. Um, I'm I'm hoping I get a chance to go. 
Um, but even if it don't, you got to check it out because I Neil was you were so complimentary of the people running this convention that one of the main guys you were like, I it's so rare to run into somebody who is just so full of joy mm -hmm. doing the thing that they were doing. Like I, I have it like you just you were just like, man, you just talk to that guy and you're just like, oh, no, this is totally your jam. This is your this is the thing that brings you light and happiness, which is which is amazing. So if you have the means and the opportunity, check it out. Um, not everybody, of course. And an important thing about it is it's definitely an event because when you go to a con, it's a con, you know, and there's uh, be it Comic Con, be it Gen Con, be it anything. There's stuff going on everywhere, every which way, every, every, every. And like I remember being at Comic Con, seeing 10,000 people, no clue why they're over there, but I cannot invest any more thought into that process because I know I have to go be where I need to be right now or I'll never see right, what I want to exactly. see. I can yeah. never know. What adventure they are on. It is. It cannot <laughs> relate to my my person. <laughs> that mystery and, is dead. No, God. Um, <laughs> and the same with Gen Con is I need to decide what are the things at Gen Con that I want to do with my day because there are too many to do it. Whereas this is an event because essentially as a as someone going, you're spending four hours a day playing D&D, &D, but then you're also on a cruise. So some people came with their families and did the excursions and all of those other things because they'll like – it was the ship where I think there were 4,000 passengers and, you know, we only represented uh, 200 of those. So then all the cruise based things were still happening all day. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely there to focus. But, yeah, my utmost compliments to Drew, because there are definitely versions of these events where a person is going with the intent to spe specifically make money, to create clout, to do a lot of other things. And I'm my judgment of those is for another time, but what? Because I, well, all I want to say is that Drew is being very successful at those, simply because you can literally like he'll be just sitting there watching people and just ear to ear, just the biggest smile a person could possibly have because <laughs> he's facilitating these experiences for the people um, that are showing up at the con. So yeah, any if it's there, if it's uh, I think they call it the Battle Barge, where it's focused on Warhammer Forty Thousand. Or GakuCon, which is more focused on cosplay um, and things like that. So then if any of those three uh, speak to you, event.cruises. So when you said they've done they've done seven other thing, other events, uh, they weren't seven other uh, RPG focused cruises. They were seven other events that include like the Warhammer 40K yep. and the OK, cool. But it seems like they're getting it down, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, to be vague and not be mean to anyone specifically, I have definitely been at places that have been running for many years, and I would say their year one makes that pay, like pale in comparison. Oh, wow. Even after That's years amazing. of running it. Um, because again, I think the focus is on the people that are going, be, the, be it the people that are running or the people that are there as attendees. Like That's the primary focus of their event yeah. is just to make sure as many people have the best time as they possibly can, which is a bit of an X factor because you're on a giant city stuck in the ocean that keeps going back and yeah. forth, whether you want it to <laughs> or not, not everybody had a great time, <laughs> but it's not because of it was, that's literally the motion of the ocean. I was very happy to not be one of those people uh, because that was also my first cruise ever. I would like to point out as someone who does get motion sickness and has been on a couple of cruises, uh, the fact that you're in the basement, deeply helps the higher up you are on the boat the more swing there is the harder it really is so yeah so that can really help of of one thing or another plus you know it's basement that's fantastic I hopefully hopefully we both get to go or hopefully at least you get to go back because that sounded amazing to me so we had a bunch of stuff that we well we wanted to make some other announcements and and talk about what's coming up next for us uh in whelms with uh season four of Young Justice, but there's uh, some other things that we really wanted to talk about too that we feel are pretty important. So let's hand it back to Emily to to talk about some of that for us. So uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, so many of our listeners probably already know that much of the entertainment industry is currently on strike. Uh, but in case you don't know about this or why it's important or how it could affect us here at Whelmed, Here's the deal of what's going on there. 
So on March 2nd of 2023, the WGA, or the Writers Guild of America, went on strike against the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. And then on July 14th of 2023, the Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, joined them on strike. And that means that at the time of this recording, the writers have been on strike for over 125 days, while the actors have been also out on the picket lines for over 50 days. So across the board, this is shaping up to be a huge and historic event in the entertainment industry that could change a lot of things. So for both unions, the strikes are about getting fair compensation for their work, fair residuals in an era of online streaming, protection from AI, and uh, several other key factors that are important and complicated and nuanced. The strikes are about protecting everyday workers and preserving acting and screenwriting as viable working and middle class career paths. If you're a fan of movies and TV, you should care about the strikes. Even if you're not a writer or an actor, even if you never plan on pursuing a creative career, even if you think this contract negotiation doesn't affect you personally in any way, if you enjoy watching entertainment, you should care about the people who create those stories being able to survive and make a living. Not just so that they can keep telling the stories that you love, which is important, but also because they're people and they just want to be treated fairly by the people making a profit off of their work. But you might be wondering, how or why does this affect Whelmed in any way? Well, uh, when SAG-AFTRA went on strike, they issued a lot of guidelines for their members. One of their rules was asking SAG-AFTRA members not to promote any struck work, meaning any work that is, was, or would have been covered by the television, theatrical, and streaming contract that they're currently striking against. And promotion includes what the union refers to as rewatch, review, and companion podcasts. So even though none of us are part of SAG-AFTRA or the WGA, we wanted to follow their guidelines as closely as we could to stand in solidarity with those currently on strike. And as creatives ourselves, none of us wanted to jeopardize our ability to join either of these unions in the future if we were given the opportunity. So after reading over all of the information provided by SAG for podcasters and content creators, We reached out to see if we'd be okay to release Whelmed without going against any of their union requests. And since Young Justice is an animated series and therefore covered under a different SAG after contract than the one currently being struck, we were told that we were in the clear to continue recording and releasing without violating the strike order. Again, while none of us are members of either of these unions and therefore don't technically have to follow their rules, we wanted to show our support and stand in solidarity with them. We wanted to do the right thing in the right way, and we wanted to explain it all to our listeners in case you'd heard about any other review podcasts being put on hold or changing topics for the duration of the strike, and we're wondering if we'd be affected. To learn more about the strikes, you can check out the individual websites for the Writers Guild of America and SAG-AFTRA. And there are tons of professional writers and actors currently on the picket lines who have been posting on social media with approachable, in-depth explanations of what the strikes are about, who they affect, and why they matter. If you want to support everyone in the entertainment industry who's currently being affected by the strikes, which includes not only the actors and writers actively striking, but all of the crew members and support staff whose productions have been put on hold as a result of the work stoppage, one of the easiest ways to do that is by donating to the Entertainment Community Fund, which is an organization that provides relief and assistance to members of the entertainment industry during times like these. If you've ever loved a movie with your entire heart, if you've ever rushed home to watch the new episode of your favorite TV show, if you've ever started a podcast just to talk about a cartoon, (laughs) then the strikes should matter to you because the people who made those stories possible deserve to be protected and compensated fairly for the hard work that they do. Thank you, Emily. Hey, Neil, can we put a link to the Entertainment Community Fund in the show notes for this episode? Absolutely. Let's do that. Yeah, this. Yeah, we 
we here at Whelmed, I mean, it, through the podcast, call some of our guest friends, and this is directly affecting them. And if it's not affecting you, yeah. it will it will affect you. And that's one of the big things about production timelines. Like the fact of the matter is that even a hundred days may not seem like it's affecting what's being produced, but it's because those things were filmed potentially two years ago, and post production has taken that time, or release schedule has been those things. So like the echoes of what's happening are still happening, and you will see them. Like that is unquestionably true also to to a point that i want to bring up there has been discussions about potential video game companies joining this as well which could also imply that certain animation companies join this process as well so there is a chance that mid-season we stop i mean we'll let you know the hows and the whys of that but i just want to be up front that if if it comes to it i know that's the direction we as a group will go so um i'm not saying it will i'm just saying it can the reason for that is because so many uh different aspects of the entertainment industry are covered under different contracts and both the wga and sag uh function by negotiating those contracts not just negotiating with companies So the fact that animation and video games are still on the board is because those contracts negotiations have not either come up for review uh, for certain ones of them or are still under negotiation and have not resulted in a strike being what the decision that either union came down to was. So as each of those things are currently evolving, the uh, video game uh, industry negotiations being one of them that has just kind of come into the spotlight as a possibility we will see how those evolve based on how those negotiations go and what companies get added to the list of what both unions are striking against it's a complicated thing it is ever evolving transmission interrupted so between the time we originally recorded this and when it's actually coming out for all of our listeners There's been a really important development about the entertainment industry strikes that you just heard us talking about. Near the end of September, the Writers Guild of America was able to reach a deal with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which then led to the end of the writers' strike. This new deal had so many important gains for the writers' union, including pay increases, protections from AI, and performance-based residuals on streaming content. All of those changes, as well as several other developments outlined in the new contract, are groundbreaking and life-changing for so many writers in the film and television industry. The writer's strike lasted for 148 days, and just after midnight on September 27th of 2023, it officially came to an end. However, at the time I'm recording this, SAG-AFTRA has yet to reach a deal with the AMPTP, meaning that actors across the film and television industry are still on strike. That means that the strike guidelines we discussed earlier about not promoting struck work still stand for all members of the Actors' Union, and will still be following them in solidarity for the duration of the strike, until a fair deal is reached for them as well. And, with all of that said, let's get back to the rest of the Intel update. Resume transmission. If, if it does end up affecting us as well, we might take another hiatus if necessary. Or, you know, as mentioned earlier, like some uh, review podcasts are changing topics or discussion or parallel podcasts are changing topics temporarily. We may find something else to discuss uh, that's that works. But whatever ends up happening, we'll let you know with an Intel update uh, about what our plans are and what's happening. So for now... We're recording. We have six episodes in the can. We have the discussion episode with Caleb. Um, one of my big challenges where I'm at, which I mentioned a few times, I think, uh, or well, we, I mentioned a few times in the past on episodes that you probably haven't heard because we haven't aired them yet. <laughs> it's my internet uh, where I am is the only downside. So as Neil said, it would have been faster for me to stick a uh, a thumb drive in the mail and mail him my WAV file uh, than it was for me to try to send it via internet. So the challenge there is uh, for me is that I want to get into doing some more discussion episodes and doing some other things. So we've been in contact with the people we can talk to. Uh, again, the strike makes it a little bit funky about who can talk to who, when, and where. Animation at the moment is not being affected, but it may be something that you know some of the actors and and things may be 
may want to take into account, but that doesn't mean we don't have other fans of the show and other people from different industries that aren't part of sag after and whatnot that are interested in coming on and continuing to talk on the show. Speaking, that was a beautiful segue. We're getting better. After you hear the bloopers, you can hear how good things have gotten in the span <laughs> of hey. the last hour. But <laughs> Okay. All right. So we had a lot of bloopers in the first like 10 minutes of Game Act <laughs> recording the game. It was but material. speaking of the release, the release schedule, the things that we already have, the things that we're going to have, this is by my napkin math. This is going to be coming out on October 2nd. This is where if you dear listener, if you're listening right away, that's when you are hearing it. One week from today, October 9th, we will have the discussion episode with Caleb about magic and starting on October 16th and every other week after that, we will have our season four episodes dropping. Neil, why did you choose that uh, that day? Because <laughs> I looked back and that's the exact day that season four, episode one released. And I thought that was very funny. And then the title was called Inhospitable, which I also thought was ironic <laughs> that that was kind of how the time between the last episode was and this one. <laughs> <laughs> inhospitable internet, inhospitable events, <laughs> inhospitable everything. So there we are. That is our current uh, production schedule. And will we have in things in between? Will we have things that are different? I don't know, but only time will tell. But we, I, what I can say without a shadow of a doubt that we are excited to be back together. Three of us recording, catching up, living life. Yes. And then hopefully you, dear listener, are as excited to hear us talk about things. Um. So does anybody have anything else coming up that's unrelated to to whelms what's coming up on uh on dmb neil anything new and exciting you ask that and what's very interesting for me is that i don't plan those out as far as you would think i do um so some things that have come out recently doing a lot of trying to going back to the like dancing with the ones that brought us. I realized that like oh. there are things that work. That, well, just the idea that there are things that were, have worked really well over the years. Um, and there's always that idea to like try and go diverge out to these different spaces and places. But at the same time, you know, the reason that kill every monster is such a success is because you're focusing in on a topic. So we are going back to like our raw real monsters um, to maybe skirt. <laughs> A copyright issue because there's a show called Ah Real Monsters. Um, but focusing on monsters, going back to our um, Divine Spotlight series where we are talking about um, an individual deity in some realm, going back to our class analysis. Usually I come up with a fun name, Prevalent Paladin, something with alliteration as well. But then also going back to our ancestral analysis episodes where we're breaking down individual species in the game. So and then g going way off the beaten path where Mitch wanted to talk about bear folk. Those are not in standard D&D, &D, but he has them in his game and he was very excited. Um, so and again, I think it's I think it's really just a focus on really trying to find that excitement as well as uh, promoting voices that typically don't um, wh whenever I can. That's awesome. Um, I am now uh, I was just sharing with you guys before we went on air. I am actually, I've been shifting around. I am going to be doing some hospice work, some private hospice work as an end of life specialist. And uh, I've been doing a bit of uh, back, back to my previous career, doing some massage therapy and some work mostly with uh, um, older patients. But in addition to that, my wife and I, we homeschool, as we've mentioned on the show before. And so we, my wife has been setting up tutoring. She teaches Spanish, doing other things here in our local community. But I am starting to do professional RPG classes for kids and teens, uh, which I'm really excited about. It's going to start in October. About the time this airs, actually, I should have probably had my first game session. Uh, mostly to, to targeted at our, our local kind of homeschool community, but there's actually a really strong gaming community in this relatively small town area that we moved into, which I'm really excited about. So, and then my wife and I, I'll be getting back on uh, doing some columns. So hopefully having my website back up, games change, change lives, gameschangelives.com. And then uh, gets talking about education and the gamification of education and how we use board games and RPGs to, to educate kids and get them excited about writing and learning and storytelling and cooperation and all the things. So 
I would love to come back on DMB at some point in time and talk about talk about the, the gamification of education and stuff, if you'll have me. I know a guy. Yeah, you know a guy? <laughs> Mitch? No, it's just me. It's, yeah, okay. It's def- <laughs> definitively only me. So <laughs> I think we can work that out. Uh, that sounds awesome. So I would love to do that. What about you, Emily? You have any hit projects or things coming up? Well, speaking of tabletop RPGs, I forgot to mention that earlier this year, I wrote and released a rpg scenario supplement uh for an indie game called broken uh written by uh, benjamin wallace that is a game about breakups actually um and it's a game about telling the story of how our relationship falls apart but it is a really interesting game that uses the mechanic of breaking actual physical objects at the table with your gaming partner to illustrate like the moments in which you fall out of love with someone it is a really interesting emotional cathartic but i got to write a scenario for it that's called heroic heartbreak and it is about uh, <laughs> two superheroes that are dating what? and then break up <laughs> um and so yes uh because it's it's a really interesting game and there are several scenarios written uh for the kickstarter several of them are up I believe all of the scenarios are free with a purchase of the game. You can buy his game on his on his itch.io store, and then the supplements are there for free download. Uh, and mine comes with a narrative meet cute that I have written out between the two superheroes, uh, whose names are Starbolt and Nimbus, or Abigail Cook and Darren Lee are their real names. It comes with a description of the setting that the that they're. Uh, relationship and breakup takes place in and gives you kind of some general sweeping ideas of what the superhero city I invented for them to live in is. It also comes with a descriptions for each of the characters, their traits and whatnot uh, for playing those characters, and thus the traits that each player falls out of love with as the game goes on. And it comes with a list of 10 items for you to break uh, at the table. Uh, some of which are very easy and some of which are very superheroish. Uh, one of them on my list is a skyscraper. You get to figure out how you do that. <laughs> uh, and it's very fun. This was my follow up question. I was like, yeah, you break stuff around your house. That's the mechanic. I'm like, OK, I get how Dread uses a Jenga tower uh, instead of dice. But wait, what? How does this work? So what are some of the other? Are they household items or what do you do? So part of it, the game does come with an explanation for if you can either get actual objects and gives you like recommendations for like, go to a thrift store, go to a garage sale, buy something for cheap, use it in your game uh, kind of thing. Uh, But also has thing of like, you can also just write things down on a piece of paper and rip them up as the game goes on if you don't want to actually break things. But The way that it's supposed to work is that each of the objects is used as kind of a narrative jumping off prompt for the person to explain a scene, to set a scene of what this represents in your relationship as it falls apart, and then tie it into, after you play out a scene, which of the traits that is listed for each character is the one that you kind of cross off on the list of like, that right. is no longer a reason that we're in love kind of thing. And so my list for uh, my scenario that I wrote has some things that are very superhero-y, like a skyscraper and a robot, and some others that are more tied in to the characters themselves. There's a champagne glass, and there is also a one of my favorites was cookie or other baked good, because I wanted to have a thing you could destroy that gets to be oh, a snack oh. in the middle of the game if it's stressful. <laughs> Because one of the two characters works at a bakery, so I give you a snack break in the middle of this game. <laughs> this was this was an intentional design choice. On <laughs> that my is part. quality game design quality. <laughs> because um, when making my list, and one of the things when we were all writing our scenarios was kind of trying to come up with things that were different and gave you a different tactile experience of like I don't just want a bunch of things that you snap in half. I want a bunch of things that you get to do interesting things yeah. at the table and come up with interesting ways of doing absolutely so if you check out my scenario there's some stuff you could burn there is some stuff you could crush there is some stuff you can break in half like whatever you want to do however you want to have this weird cathartic tabletop experience but one of them that i thought was clever and fun was 
because one of them works in a bakery. Please eat a cookie in the middle of this game as a way of destroying a thing. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's an interesting little thing. Uh, it's available out there in the world. and It is available right now? Yes, this is available right now. It got released earlier uh, this year. And yeah, hopefully I get to do more tabletop writing because I had a lot of fun with this uh, as just a very weird specific little thing of being like just creating some characters and telling people to go break their hearts. Um, Break your heart cookie. It's right in your wheelhouse. So we still have Descent to Midnight uh, got majorly delayed because of the pandemic and some some challenges some of the staff had uh, some of our team had during the pandemic. But I just finished a major rewrite that was take that took a long time on one of the chapters for the playbooks. That is now complete. Um, and we have basically one chapter left that we are doing some edits on the examples just to make sure that the actual layout works out. I've seen the layout of the chapters. It looks beautiful. Uh, I just saw one of the um, art uh, assets that I had not seen before, which is stunning by Devin George. So uh, Descend to Midnight still moving forward. We got to get this last chapter wrapped and then we can get this thing out into the world finally as well. So hopefully that will be soon. I've been saying soon for too long. Time to land this plane or park this boat, dock this boat. I don't know how that analogy is supposed to go, that metaphor. Release but this fish into the ocean. Release this kraken. Yeah, something. Release <laughs> release the kraken. Okay, sorry. You can scratch all of what I said and just go straight to release the kraken. Nailed it. Perfect. Uh, and I think that's it for now for this Intel update. So, uh, uh, Neil, you said uh, this is going to be released probably on October 2nd. Mm-hmm. And then October 9th, uh, come back again for the interview with myself and Caleb, the Caleb G uh, at a Catacon la- from last year, talking about magic in the Young Justice universe and DC Comics in general. Uh, I forgot what we said, so I'm looking forward to listening to it again. And then the week after that, we will have episode one of season four. So thanks so much for listening and sticking with us uh, through all of our hiatuses uh, and delays and world catching on fire events of the last few years. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. Stay whelmed, everyone. Are we doing that? Stay whelmed, everyone. Are we doing all that? <sighs> yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. I don't know. <laughs> we don't have an outline, Rich. It's, a, it's an Intel update. I cannot stress that enough. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.